Money. We all need it. Many want more of it. Others worry if they're saving enough of it. Perhaps you want to start a business. Maybe you're trying to get out of debt. Some people think managing money is easy. This is a podcast for the rest of us. The folks that are too embarrassed, afraid to ask, or just don't know where to go to get help. Welcome to The Save Space, brought to you by U.S. Bank. Hi, I'm Kelly Sutton. I'm a radio host of Country Roads on TuneIn, a TV host, a music lover, a wife, and a mom. I love talking to people. It's what I do for a living. Whether I'm talking to celebrities, co-workers, or even my daughter, finance is not something that ever comes up in regular conversation. Which I totally understand. I mean, finance is oftentimes considered a private matter. It's usually complicated, but it is really important. That's the thing. For many of us, managing finances is often intimidating. That's why TuneIn has teamed up with our friends at U.S. Bank to create this new podcast series. Our goal is to introduce ideas, tell stories, and give you some tips to help improve your financial IQ. Look, we're not saying that you should be talking about your 401k at your next get-together. But we do need to talk about finance, because it could really help us build the life we want for ourselves and our loved ones. Throughout this series, we'll talk with musicians, influencers, entrepreneurs, and financial experts. We'll learn some best practices, introduce some out-of-the-box ideas, and maybe have some fun along the way. No judgments, no dumb questions. We're creating a safe space to talk about money. Okay, let's get into the safe space. So in today's episode, we are talking about managing your household. Your home, in a sense, is the original safe space. Everyone's household is different. So we're going to gather a few different perspectives. Today's guests include Cheddar News anchor Hope King. She's going to sit down with one of the nation's top financial educators, author, and podcaster, Ash Cash Exantis. Musicians Natalie Prass and Eric Slick are about to get married, and they're going to talk about being indie musicians. How are you saving money for a big wedding? That's coming to us courtesy of some very cool friends of ours at the podcast Talk House. And to help us with a few tips, I'll sit down with money girl Laura Adams. Now, of course, at the end of the day, you'll have to decide really what works best for your situation. But remember, the goal is to give you some ideas tell some stories, and improve your financial literacy so you can make those decisions no matter what life throws at you. Running a household is really hard. I'm a working mom, and honestly, I barely have time to sit down and balance my checkbook. Actually, who balances a checkbook these days? Nobody. Obviously, if you're listening to this, well, you could probably use some assistance as well. To help us get a bit more of that cheese pun intended. We've teamed up with Cheddar News to be one of our financial experts throughout this series. If you're not familiar with Cheddar, they are what you would call a post-cable network, meaning online only. You can check them out on all of your devices. They regularly cover business news and news of the day. So for our first segment, we'll be hearing from Cheddar anchor Hope King. She hosts Cheddar Movers and Closing Bell from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Hope is sitting down with personal finance expert Ash Cash Exantis. Ash is the founder and CEO of MindRight Money Management, a financial education company that blends psychology and personal finance. He's a best selling author and he hosts his own podcast, The Ash Cash Show. Part financial expert, part motivational speaker, I'm sure he'll have tons of helpful advice. So let's go to Hope and Ash for a little guidance on how we can manage our household. Thanks for having me, Kelly. We are super excited to partner with TuneIn and U.S. Bank to create the Save Space podcast where we help boost your financial IQ no matter what stage of life you're in. And today I am joined with the chief financial educator, Ash Cash. Ash, great to have you on with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. So you've been helping people with their money for over a decade. Yes. And let's talk specifically about when two people want to come together. Oh, the juicy stuff. Yeah. Yes. And they're combining lives and combining their finances. What is the first thing that both of these people should think about? I think it's important that the first thing is to understand where everyone is, right? Which each individual is as it relates to finances. You know, in the past, 
couples would not talk about it and then later on find out about a debt or find out about something that existed and then it is chaos and then it's too late. So I think that uh, being transparent and having that conversation up front is really important because as you have that conversation, it really dictates which direction you go as it relates to your finances, whether you say, you know what? you clean this up first before we put our money together or it makes sense for us to tackle it together. But if you don't have that conversation early on, it doesn't allow you guys to come together and have a a great plan to how how you're going to tackle your finances. Well, since you've been helping so many couples, what are some of the biggest trends and patterns that you've seen when two people join their lives together? Uh, I'm noticing now that, I mean, first of all, couples are waiting until they get established in order to start getting into those relationships. And so because of that, you're now seeing a lot of couples, when they come together, they have their own, you know, their own assets and 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 liabilities and their debt already. And so when they're coming together, they're a little more open about having that conversation opposed to, you know, when you think about previous generations where, you know, they would get together straight out of high school or straight out of college and and, and would build this financial life together. Now it's happening separately and then it's coming together. And so now there's, you know, more of a transparency. They're willing to have that conversation before they actually, you know, get together and it's actually okay. It's not taboo. At one point it was like, oh, you know, don't don't talk about money at the dinner table. But now that's actually, you know, common common conversation. Right. We're adulting a little yes. bit longer before we come together as adults. What about when it comes to the law of attraction, right? When it comes to love, there's a saying that opposites attract. Is yes. that the same when it comes to how people spend and save money? Oh, no, absolutely. I'm noticing that you know, you see a lot of people who you might have a spender, right? So there's uh, financial languages, right? And you might have somebody who's a spender, somebody who's an investor, somebody who's a saver, um, and you never see savers and savers get together. It's usually, you know, a saver and a spender or an investor, and a, you know, um, and so it is, it is true. Uh, that opposites do attract. And I think that, you know, as it relates to the finances, it does give that balance because being uh, too much of one thing isn't necessarily a good thing. And so, you know, having those opposites attract are a good thing as it relates to the finances. But it does come to sort of a point at, uh, y- you know, if you're looking to buy a house or if you're looking to save for another big event where you have two different financial personalities coming together, how do you try to, if you're in the room, help them come to a compromise, and if you're not in the room, how do these two different types of spenders and savers come to compromises? No, I, that's a great question, and I think it's it's important that there is a common thread, and so you start with the commonality, right? So if you have a spender and you have a saver, um, it's not okay to say don't spend or don't save, but what needs to happen is you find that goal. What is that common goal? And now together, collectively, you create a plan that's going to lead you to achieving that financial goal. And so anything outside of that financial goal, then you guys have spoken about it together first, um, and then you start working towards it, but you can still leave room to say, okay, let's budget some money for you to spend, or let's budget some money, you know, let's automate those savings. So everyone's satisfied. And so no one feels like they're compromising. No one feels like they're not being heard or left out. But start with that financial goal, that that common goal, and then start working on it together. That's great. And sometimes one couple, uh, one person in, in the couple might come into the relationship with maybe more debt than the other person. Maybe go through how you should approach that conversation. And even, you know, sometimes these conversations can be really difficult. And sometimes you might feel like you're being shamed by your partner. If you have more debt or you feel disadvantaged or embarrassed by it, how do you overcome those feelings? Yeah, no, I I think that um, number one, both parties should not go in from a judgmental perspective because everybody has a different money story. Everybody has a different circumstance. And if you're the person that has the debt, you know, don't go in there thinking as the, as if you did something wrong because that's the majority of us, you know. And I think that, you know, especially in my work, working with people and couples uh, specifically about money, people have this, they do have this shame not realizing that that is the norm. 
It's not that, you know, you're different or you're an outlier because you have this debt. And so I think that approaching it from a pr- perspective of not being judgmental, number one, but then also if you're the one that has the debt, understand that this is, you know, it's not your fault. You know, you, you start from where you are currently. And then as you start to think about the debt and, and, and create a plan for the debt, you know, again, that transparency is important because as you're talking to your partner about the debt, you guys could come together and figure out, is this something that you're going to tackle by yourself or is this something that the couple is going to tackle together? So how do you know what you should do, especially maybe let's say with credit card debt, if you should consolidate or not, what are some practical tips for folks out there that are looking at this problem right now? Yeah. So I think, you know, it's really finding, okay, first of all, finding out uh, what is this debt? Is it student loans? Is it credit cards? With credit card debt specifically, uh, it's important to understand that the higher your credit card debt, it is negatively impacting your credit score, right? So your utilization, when you think about your credit score, you have those five categories. 35% is your payment history, 30% is your usage, 15 is the length of credit history, 10 is your new credit, and 10 is the credit mix. But that 30% usage ratio means that if you have a $1,000 credit card, you should not be using over 30% of your credit limit. In fact, your credit score goes from 300 to 850 and anything over 720 is excellent credit. Those who have excellent credit actually keep their utilization ratio down between 10 to 15 percent, right? And so understanding that carrying a credit card balance uh, is negatively impacting your score. So if you're looking at consolidating that debt, um, it is not a bad idea if you're going to take that debt and transfer it into something fixed, like a fixed loan. So now you know exactly how much you're going to have to pay. When is that debt going to be paid off in full? And now that debt that was transferred from a revolving line of credit into a loan is now not going to negatively impact the score. In fact, it's going to help your credit score because that usage ratio goes down. Wow. I think a lot of people out there, a light bulb just went off in their head. I know one in my head just went off because I that utilization is, is so important that impact the score, when is it the right time to consolidate in a relationship? Is it when you're closer to, you know, a legally binding uh, relationship status or or is it maybe a lot sooner than that? Yeah, I would say um, sooner just to test it out. Right. And so, you know, we have the tendency to say, okay, I want to buy the car. So here's the money for the car. And you just drive out the lot. Then now you own the car and you're like, hey, I didn't really like it. Right. And so I say test drive it first. And I, I think that maybe start with small things. If you move in together, maybe, you know, you handle this bill, I handle that bill. Just so you get to get an idea of what uh, their money management skills are before you make that commitment. And I think once you start to, blend finances slowly. You get to understand their money personality. You get to feel them out. And then you can have certain conversations. So that way, when you have the bigger conversation, you can know whether, you know what, I don't really like how you manage money, so let's keep it separate if we decide to legally get together. Or, you know what, I love how you, you're, you're doing it. Let's 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 do this together. Let's create this plan. And I don't think it's a right or wrong. You know, I, I used to think, well, if you're married, you're one, you should all put it together. Uh, but I've seen situations where I've seen couples very successful merging finances together. But then I've seen couples very successful keeping it separate. Um, and so I don't think it's a right or wrong. I think it's a preference, and I think what— what, what works for your relationship ultimately is what you should do. Okay, so talk it out and, and figure out what everybody wants and hopefully come to a compromise. So that's all good. Now, in every relationship, there can sometimes be stumbles and maybe one person ends up losing his or her job. What should happen first in this relationship when that happens? Yeah, I think that, I mean, hopefully— Before that happened, we were working on a financial freedom fund. I used to call it an emergency fund, but words have power, and we don't want to call emergencies into our life. And so hopefully we've been working on a financial freedom fund of that three to six months of expenses. But if that has not happened, I think that the first thing is to really just assess the situation because I think that's the most important thing. When someone loses a job or income is lost, we go into panic mode, we go into 
okay, how do I fix this without really just taking a full assessment? Where are you right now? You know, what is the the debt situation? What are the bills? Can that one salary that remains, can that manage everything? If it cannot, then the, the discussion has to happen on, you know, what are we going to pull back on, right? What do we have to adjust temporarily as the other person gets th- themselves back on their feet? Let's talk about the adjustments. Do you get a gig economy job? Do you start selling things that you own? What are the must-dos and what are the must-don'ts? Oh, absolutely you get a gig economy job. Absolutely you start to look at ways to sell things. Uh, In fact, it's better to do those things even while you have a job because I'm a big proponent of having multiple streams of income because if you're reliant on just one source of income, that's not real financial freedom and things can happen. And so definitely get a gig economy job, especially now, right? Right. Today, we have direct access to the consumer. And so there's so many things that that we can do. We can drop ship. We could, you know, sell things on Amazon. If we have uh, a skill, we can sell courses online. We can write a book. We can, There's just so many things that, that we can do uh, that doesn't take as much time as it did before. You know, definitely look at things that you have that are valuable that you can start selling off because the more you're able to, to replenish that bank account, you know, the less things you have to sacrifice and you may be able to keep your same lifestyle while you try to replace that income. Okay, so we're trying to maintain that income coming in. What about stopping it from going out? What are some best tips for saving when someone in a relationship loses a job? Yeah, I I think automatically it's looking at those discretionary expenses, right? And so there there are things that you have to pay for, you know, shelter, food, and even food sometimes, right? A lot of us go out a lot. um, And so maybe it's taking a look at how much money are you spending going out? Maybe instead of buying lunch every day, you bring in your lunch. Maybe instead of going out, you know, three times a week, you go once a week. Really just look at those discretionary expenses. you know, where are those money leaks? Where can you plug, you know, plug in those holes? And you'll be surprised, you know, especially now we almost live in a cashless society. Uh, when you have a hundred dollar bill and you break that hundred dollar bill, it's harder to get rid of that money. Cause you're like, wow, I had a hundred. And, but now when you think about your, you know, you have Apple pay, you have Venmo cash app, your debit card. Sometimes you don't even realize what you're spending because it's, it feels like free money. And so it's easy to, you know, have, all of these money leaks and not even realize it. So it's really important that we take a step back and really assess where is that money going and what are those things that we could cut back on to, you know, start to to increase our savings. Okay. Those are fabulous tips and hopefully nobody needs to use them. But if so, there they are. Yes. Now, the next stage in a relationship, if you've already joined forces, maybe you want to start a family and childcare, children are expensive and education. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So how do you, as a couple, start to plan for that in advance? Oh, absolutely. So I think that it's important to, um, you know, knowledge is, having the knowledge is really key um, and and being proactive instead of reactive. And so it's important that uh, before you even have children is really kind of look, you know, survey, what are those prices for child care? You know, you know, what type of education do you want your, your child to have? Um, and then start to prepare for it. Start to, you know, literally create a fund, have a separate savings account that you start to to actually save for. I have a trick that I use with my clients as well, uh, where I say, okay, before you even start to plan to have a child, pretend that you do. What would it cost for childcare? What would it cost for all of these different things? Add that to your budget and then start to put that money aside to see what your life would be like before you have the child. The reason why this exercise is important because if if it starts to stress you out before the child is actually here, then you have to do two things. Maybe you have to delay having the child or you have to figure out how to make some more money before that child gets into the picture. So it's important that we plan ahead. I'm getting stressed out just thinking about it. I'm nowhere near that stage of (laughs) life. So that is good to know. Try to test it out. Now, what about when you have children? You've been talking to kids a lot this summer. What's the number one money-saving tip you tell these kids? So number one money-saving tip is to live below your means. Just because you have it does not mean you should spend it. So if you have $10, make sure you make a habit. You put a dollar aside, you put $2 aside, get into the habit of of putting money away because what happens is that, uh, you know, especially kids, 
teaching kids that early will allow them to understand that when they work, taxes are going to come out of their check. Or if they're a freelancer, they're going to have to put money aside for taxes. But then also, they're going to under- they need to understand that they, they can't only rely on their physical labor. And so as you're making money, you should be saving money so that way you can invest it in things that create passive income. So number one, live below your means and then start that habit of savings. And it goes right back to how the credit card companies score us too. If you are under that utilization rate, you're rewarded with a higher credit score. So it all makes a lot of sense. Ash, it was such a pleasure to have you. I've learned so much. Ash Cash is the chief financial educator at Mind Right Money Management. Thank you so much for joining us and helping get us in order with our household finances. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, that was some great and inspiring advice from Ash Exantis. I love his approach to finance. No wonder he's dubbed the financial motivator. Thank you very much. And thank you, Hope King from Cheddar News. Very interesting information. All right, after the break, a real world example of how life's moments can impact how you manage your household. And some indie music darlings are planning a wedding. More to come. This episode of the Save Space podcast is brought to you by U.S. Bank. For everyone working toward their goal, U.S. Bank is there to help. Whether you're buying a home or dealing with unexpected expenses, U.S. Bank wants to help you grow your financial IQ so you can handle whatever life throws at you. From personal finance to business strategies, access free resources that will help you improve your financial literacy. There's something for everyone. Visit usbank.com slash financial IQ or just tell your smart speaker, grow my financial IQ. Okay, let's get back to the safe space. Managing your household is a problem for all walks of life, especially if you're a musician. A little fame doesn't necessarily mean financial security. Coming up next, we have some special guests, courtesy of our friends from the podcast Talk House. Now, if you're not familiar with Talk House, they're an amazing first-person media outlet where all of the content, writing and podcasting, is created by artists. So host Josh Modell regularly sits down with musicians, filmmakers, and actors, offering a very unique peer-to-peer perspective of their creative process. Now, personal finances may not be as sexy as music or film productions, but it does require some creativity, especially when tackling some of life's bigger moments, like a wedding. Which is why we asked Josh to sit down with recently engaged indie music darlings Natalie Prass and Eric Slick. Natalie is a singer-songwriter on the rise. She's currently on tour, and her latest release, The Future and the Past, is incredible. So make sure you check it out. Eric is a renowned drummer. He's a part of Dr. Dog. And sometimes he gets to go on tour with his fiance. All right, enough chit-chat. Let's turn it over to Josh so we can find out how these touring musicians make ends meet while they're on the road and planning a wedding. Thanks, Kelly. At TalkHouse, we're really excited about teaming up with TuneIn and U.S. Bank to shed light on some of life's trickier financial moments. As you just heard, I'm Josh Modell, and for the next six episodes of Save Space, we'll be sitting down with some of our very talented friends and having real, honest, and authentic conversations about money. So let's jump into this delightful, enlightening chat we had with Natalie Prass and Eric Slick. Shall we talk about how we have no money? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we want to talk about money. So we could even start just by saying, I think that was funny that you said, let's talk about how we we have no money. Do you guys (laughs) feel like you have no money? I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with how I was raised. I come from a very thrifty family. We were not poor, but it was always just like, don't overspend, money is precious, and never get in debt. Just kind of being scared of the fact that money can just go away. Yeah, and on my side of things, my family sort of had the opposite viewpoint, which was a little bit more like, you only get one life, so spend all the money you earn. <laughs> what what does it matter? Like, if you want a guitar, buy it. If you want the record you covet, just go out and buy it, you know? And I've had to learn how to get financially literate over the years, for sure. So is that any sort of sense of friction with Natalie being like, oh, wait, let's save, and and Eric saying, oh, well, we only live once, let's buy whatever this thing is that we want? Or have you kind of moved to a a more centered place? I think it's pretty centered at this point. 
Yeah, like if there's anything that I want to get, I usually clear it with Natalie first, or you know, and vice versa. But we had, um, and I wanted to bring this up. Like at the beginning of 2018, uh, it was actually New Year's Day. Natalie and I were driving from Philadelphia to Virginia, and on that drive, Nat was like, "All right, we need to make like a financial plan, and you got to like figure out how to save money." And I was like, oh, you know, I, I get initially the sort of like anxiety kicked in, but then we listened to a bunch of podcasts like You Need a Budget. And we listened to all these things that were like really informative. And I think it really encouraged us to start saving. Yeah, start saving and start building something together. So that was like a really big turning point for me to be like, oh, yeah, you know, every time I go out and Spend money on a coffee, or uh, you know, if I'm not necessarily not necessarily frivolous with money, but just not like conscious of what I'm spending my money on. But um, now we're like, okay, let's make coffee at home. Let's cook at home. Let's try to limit our expenses, our little spending. We just think a little bit more when we go out and spend money now. How long have you guys been together? If you don't mind me asking, three and a half years. And this is a weird question, but one that's come up in friendly conversations I've had with people that I know. But when did you sort of combine your finances? And part of the reason I ask is because I know uh, some good friends of mine are married, they Mm -hmm. have kids, and they didn't even combine their bank accounts until very recently, Mm -hmm. which I always thought was a little strange. But so it makes me wonder how other people make that decision and what goes into it. Technically, we have not yet. Mm -mm. Um, We have talked about it quite a bit, but we do have a shared savings account. I know a lot of people nowadays kind of look at as, you know, having your separate accounts, like I want my own money, you have your own money. But we were making a conscious decision to be a team together and to be honest and to work through life together. So I think part of that is joining your bank account. I think that's just a couple to couple decision, but for us, it makes sense. So we are going to eventually do that. But right now we just have a shared account, want this one shared account that we're saving in. But yeah, I mean, at this point, we more or less do like conceptually share, you know, like we're investing in things together all the time. And so I don't really feel like there's going to be much of a a leap, you know, once we do the shared bank account thing, like it it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. For us. Yeah, for us. And you guys just moved uh, to a new city together or maybe a city you had lived in. Is that correct? Yeah, we moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and this is a city that I've lived in for almost nine years. And then I moved to Richmond, Virginia, where we moved from Richmond, Virginia together. So Eric's from Philadelphia. He moved down to Richmond so we could like, you know, try to live together kind of thing. We didn't live together immediately. We took like a year to see if this was going to work. And then we moved in together and now we're in Nashville and... Our expenses have gone up significantly, at least for me. Can you give me an example on that? Like, what, what in that? Is it housing mostly, or is it kind of everything in Nashville? Housing, we're driving a lot more than we did in Richmond. Richmond, we walked almost everywhere. Um, so, we're paying a lot more for gas, oil changes, just stuff like that. We have a lot more friends here. <laughs> like, <laughs> also, our social life has completely changed. Richmond, we didn't have as many friends. And so it was just like Eric and I hanging out almost. So we're like going out more, going to shows more, all of that. (laughs) It's expensive. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) It costs a lot of money to have fun. I know, it does. Nashville made more sense for us since we're both in the music industry and there's just so many opportunities here for both of us. Yeah, it's immediately presented itself as a real like viable option for us as far as like getting work. You know, like the first week that I was here, I had work. Can you guys talk a little bit about how musicians at, at your level make their money these days? Because you read a lot about how you know you get paid pennies for streaming, but and if any of this is uncomfortable or it gets too specific, please. Oh, let's talk about it. I think people need to be real about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, me personally, so I'm a solo artist. And at my level, I'm still like very much a baby project. Like I'm still very much at the beginning, I think. Stages. I, I I don't know. I just haven't figured it out yet on how to <laughs> reel in more money, I guess. Uh-huh. I make my money off of touring. But for me, since I'm a solo artist and a lot of people 
want to hear me with a band. So when they ask me to play their venue, they want a band. So then I have to pay my musicians X amount. I have to pay for the gas travel. I am paying off my van every month as well. I'm paying for hotels. I'm paying each of the band members a per diem on top of when I'm paying them to play with me. So it's very expensive. My expenses are through the roof. But if you're a more desirable artist, you can get a higher guarantee. So right now I'm still building and I'm making more than I ever have in the past. So I guess that's something, but it's still very much like penny pinching, you know? Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, because even the bigger that you get, the higher your expenses as well. And then the difference for me being in a band situation with Dr. Dog, I am really lucky to have a salaried position. This was after years and years and years of being a freelancer and coming home from tours with like, I I remember I came home from one tour with $9 in my bank account. I came home from one tour and I had lost $600. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it took a long time to get to a position as a side musician to get to this point where I can be like somewhat financially stable. It's still just enough to live and just enough to save up a little bit. But yeah, touring is the lion's share of how we make our money. And like, just to be brutally honest, Eric's had to cover my rent twice mm-hmm, since mm-hmm. we've moved to Nashville. We moved to Nashville in September and it was like, I pay myself every month. I have a business manager, which he's amazing. He saves my ass like <laughs> constantly. <laughs> and um, I love him dearly, but he'll just be like, look, I can only give you this much this month. And I pay myself every month and it's not that much, but I can definitely live off of it because I'm so frugal. Mm-hmm. I shop at thrift stores. Like I, you know, I we cook. It's, you know, I'm trying to be as financially conscious as I can be. And uh, I'm like, I can only pay you this much this month. And I'm like, okay, Eric, (laughs) I'm very lucky. Like uh, you have my back. Yeah. That sort of ties into what we were saying earlier about us being a team. You know, it's like, yes, there's times when that can be a little bit stressful, but I've gotten to the point where I completely understand that Natalie and I, you know, we're, we're about to get married. Like, of course I'm going to cover for her. Like I wouldn't want her to feel uncomfortable about it. And I also get it. You know, because there were so many times when I've lived month to month for, you know, half of my music career Mm -hmm. was living month to month. Mm -hmm. So I get it. I totally get it. Being a solo artist is a lot harder. It's so much harder than being in a band. You have to make all these decisions and all these choices. I have so much respect for what Natalie does. So much respect. And I just think there's just less and less money now. Yeah, yeah. Um, And music because it... Anybody can just make something super quick on their laptop. Oh yeah, there's so much less money going around now. And when you know when we do get the uh, occasional check, like yeah, obviously Spotify has been, uh, Spotify and all streaming services have been beneficial to us as far as like awareness about what we're totally. doing. So that's no, it's no shade to them. It's just like systemically speaking, like you get that check and you're like, wow, that's actually a lot less than I thought it was going to be. And uh, you know, for for my position, I've had some solo records and I've had some rights on songs where I get a percentage and I'm like always sort of surprised at how staggeringly low it can be sometimes Mm -hmm. just versus what you make actually performing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you guys mind talking about planning your wedding a little bit? Yeah, I would love to. So we're getting married where I grew up in the Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Virginia area. So it's a destination wedding to a very random location. (laughs) Uh Um, So literally everybody that we have invited and including ourselves, we're all traveling to this location. So immediately it was like, okay, our guest count is probably going to be pretty conservative because we invited probably 130 people and probably only 100 people will be there, which is amazing. Um, We're very (laughs) lucky. Not only, I feel like that's still a big wedding. Yeah. So... I hired a lot of my friends that uh, live in Virginia Beach and they're amazing. Like this girl uh, that I grew up with is our chef, making all the food with her husband. One of my dear friends is taking our photos. A friend is doing our decorations. And we're so, I mean, we're still paying these people. And then I found a house on Airbnb that was unbelievable. It's this mid-century 1960s house on the water. It's like on its own little peninsula. And I just messaged him. I was like, would you 
be open to doing our wedding at your house? And he was uh. like, totally. So it's way cheaper going that route as well. So there's ways that we've tried to like make it a little bit cheaper, but it still is a huge expense for us. And I feel like our wedding is conservative. You know, like just looking at other costs of other weddings, I'm like, what? Even just looking at pictures now that I know how much stuff costs, I'm like, okay, that was $2,000, that was (laughs) $3,000. And, you know. Got to get you on the prices right. (laughs) For wedding edition. (laughs) Yeah, I would crush that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we're not going on a honeymoon either because uh, Eric and I travel so much together. We're saving that for later, like down the line. We're actually doing the opposite. We're staying in a beach house with my parents Yeah. the week after. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how far ahead do you two think about money specifically like, and, and your careers? Are you, are you starting to think about retirement stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, part of our savings fund that we started, it's like our retirement and savings fund. And Dr. Doug, you have a retirement fund already. Yes. Dr. Bi- Doug has a business manager too. Yes, the business does. Yeah. That will like, we're event, you know, it's a slow building thing where eventually we're going to figure out how that's going to be dispersed amongst people. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we started one a couple years ago. I obsess over this. Yeah. Josh, every time Eric and I have a moment together, I'm like, let's do our five year plan. Like, right now, let's go. (laughs) You know, and sometimes Eric's just like, oh my God, stop. (laughs) Just live in the moment, please. That being said, the fact that we've been able to meet halfway on it has been Mm -hmm. so great for me because I need that. I need that sort of forward thinking Mm -hmm. stuff occasionally so that I don't get stuck in my own rut of just like, you know, this is the life and it's just going to take me wherever it goes. Like, that's not always the case. It's good to prepare. But uh, for the wedding, as far as the wedding goes, like, there are all, always surprise fees that come up. So, because we've been so good at saving, especially in the last two years, when things come up now, it doesn't eat into our budget for other things. There's like a little bit of a slush fund. Yeah, since we've been saving for the past year at least, a little over a year. Mm. You know, more Eric's putting more money into it than I am. Let's just be real. But, you know, I put in money when I can. I also have my own savings account that I put $50 into every month. So, you know, we're not going to die if no. we, if like some <laughs> expense comes up. It, it does make me sad when I see like articles. Like there was an article recently where it's like most Americans can't afford like a $500 surprise expense. Well, yeah. I mean, without. You, that would be me. Right. Not like you're super rich. Let's no. just be real no, here. No, 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 not at all. Real. But not. like you have just, you make more money than me every mm-hmm. month. Mm-hmm. Not like a lot more, but more that like you would definitely not hurt if you had a surprise 500. Yeah. Me personally, yes, yeah. I would. Yeah. So I think that's why I started freaking out a year ago and I was like, we need to start saving. So yeah. it's, it's terrible that Americans have to save for their future sicknesses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you guys thinking also about buying a house together in Nashville? Yeah. We, I mean, we do want to eventually buy a house together, which we know is an extreme luxury. We would also like to buy a house that could be a rental property. That is something we've talked about. And I don't know if that's going to be in Nashville or if it's going to be back in Virginia. I personally just love living on the coast. I, it's like once I'm landlocked, I I don't know. It's not the same. <laughs> my surroundings really affect my well-being. And I love Nashville. Like I said, we have an amazing friend group here, which is the reason why we love it here. And like we've talked about potentially buying property in Nashville just as a- An investment Just property. as an investment because, yeah, I mean, yeah. Nashville's ever growing. and It's not going to stop. And- while we are relatively youthful, it's, it just seems like a, a smart idea. So I think about it all the time. But yeah, let's get. To, we're going to get through that the wedding first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, cool. thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, of course. Hopefully, we'll help people. Yeah, just being real with how you know it's not. It's not the easiest thing to talk about. We no, know it's that. Not. We and know. I, I think more people, especially like, I think more women that are in charge of their own business need to talk about how they make their money and how, because I feel like I still don't have any financial women role models. Like mm-hmm. I'm trying to find them and just being more honest, even just being more honest about how you pay for your wedding. <laughs> like, where are you getting all of this money to pay for that? And 
I just yeah. think in being brutally honest about how much your wedding costs, you know, and I feel like that's something that needs to change. Cause as soon as like you put like, this is for a wedding, then somebody charges you like a hundred percent more. There was sometimes during this wedding process, I was like, what are we doing? Let's just go into the courtroom, you know? Yeah. But I think like having all of our families together, that alone is worth it. Mm -hmm. And planning this like really fun, special party together. I'm, I'm getting like teary eyed thinking about it now. I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's worth all of the effort and worth the money, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Cause the least you can do when you're asking people to travel all this way to celebrate, you know, your love, you can at least ha throw a dank party. <laughs> That's and that's, the least and you can that's do. where we're going to end it because I really want the last thing of the interview to be dank party. <laughs> <laughs> There's the headline. That's awesome. Well, I hope and I'm sure it will be a really special day. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Josh. Talk soon. Thanks, Have a great day. Thanks so much. That was a fun one. I love how open and transparent those two were for this conversation. Again, this is Josh Modell from Talk House in Brooklyn. Back to you, Kelly. So how much does a dank party actually cost these days anyway? <laughs> Congratulations to those two. I think they're going to make it. No matter the challenge life gives you, whether it be financial or not, if you've got a solid partner by your side, it makes everything a little bit easier, right? Best of luck to the newlyweds-to-be, Natalie Prass and Eric Slick. A special thank you to Josh Modell of Talk House for doing that interview for us. Now, you heard them talk about saving for a house and a lot of other major life changes they have coming their way. Don't worry, we're going to get to all of those topics in upcoming episodes of Safe Space. So we've covered a little bit of everything from managing debt to planning a wedding. We've served up a lot of information for you, a personal finance buffet, if you will. So now we're getting to the good stuff. No, I'm not talking about dessert, although our next guest is very sweet. I am talking about some helpful and simple finance tips that you can apply to your everyday life. And to help us with that, I would like to welcome my special guest. She's a personal finance aficionado, award-winning podcaster. Her podcast, Money Girl, has over 600 episodes. She is the author of seven books, including Money Girl's Smart Moves to Grow Rich. The one, the only money girl is with us, Laura Adams. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Kelly. Wow, what a pleasure. Oh, you know what? We are so excited to talk to you. You came in from Florida to give us your tips and tricks, and we are all ears. Awesome. This is fun. Thank you. It really is. Okay, let's talk about everyday personal finance, the household. This is an overarching task. I think there are so many little things that we do day to day where we could be saving money and we just aren't. What are some things that we really should be looking into? Yeah, so, you know, it's all about being conscious. A lot of people are very unconscious when it comes to spending, so they're making a lot of impulse purchases, right? Maybe you're in the grocery store, or maybe you're like me and you love shopping online, and it's just easy to pull that trigger. That and, buy now right? button is a troublemaker. <laughs> Let me just tell you. Big time. Yeah. So I would say if you can shift your ideas about shopping, about spending from being unconscious to a little bit more conscious, you're going to really see some opportunities. So thinking about, let's say every time you make that impulse buy, what could you have done with that money? So let's say you bought those shoes when you really didn't need the shoes that money could have been working for you. It could be in a savings account. It could be in a retirement account growing for you. So I like to think about the opportunity cost that you're actually giving up when you choose to spend unconsciously. Oh. So this can roll into a lot of things because, you know, we're all different. For mm -hmm. some people, it's shoes. And, I, you know, can you... I feel do, like you're looking you right at me. Here? You're, you're looking right at me, right into my soul, Laura. And I, I'm speaking that language because you're right. You don't think about that missed opportunity cost. So really, you're saying slow down, give yourself a breath, maybe talk it over with your significant other before you pull the trigger. Yeah. If there is a dollar amount, maybe it's, you know, a hundred bucks. You say anything over a hundred, two hundred, we're going to have a chat about it. Um, anything that puts a little bit of time between you and that impulse buy, that's the secret, putting time. So maybe even saying, I'm going to wait 24 hours, the 24 hour rule before I buy those golf clubs or, you know, spend money on that vacation, whatever it is for you, that's going to help you be 
be a little bit smarter about how you're spending. I love that. You know, there's a saying, and I know everyone's heard it, I've always got too much month at the end of my money. So how do you look at the big picture and get a clearer example of where your money's going each and every month? Yeah, so you cannot manage what you don't measure. So Mm. you've got to measure it. So for some people, they love doing this. They love spreadsheets and love, you know, kind of looking at every penny. Other people hate it. So think of a way that works for you. Is it some type of a literally just a handwritten thing that you write down all of your expenses? Or are you a little bit more sophisticated and you want to use some type of a software, some sort of a personal finance software? There's a ton of them out there. Online banking, you know, there are ways Mm. that you can make that purchase, give it a category so that at the end of the month, you've got a report. You can see how much I did spend on shoes, how much I did spend on food. Beginning to measure your spending is the key. If you're not measuring it, there's no way that you're going to see, oh my goodness, I'm overspending in this category, or wait a minute, I'm not saving for retirement. Mm. So making those changes are only going to come when you get to see the big picture. It's so interesting. You keep saying measure, and I've not heard you say budget. And I feel like that's one of those words people definitely have a connotation attached to it. Budget can either be your best friend or something that you dread. So when you're measuring where your money is going, would you say you need to do that two or three months before you start to fine tune it? How do you actually jump into figuring out how to manage this finance. Yeah, if you've got the records, fantastic. If you can pull those records in, but for some people they say, oh my gosh, this is this is gonna be a lot of work. So just start where you are. Okay. Begin today measuring and looking at, okay, I'm gonna allocate all of my expenses moving forward. If you've got a few months, great. And as you mentioned, I don't like the word budget. Right. I'll be honest with you. It's like the word diet, Ugh. right? <laughs> we don't like it. We don't like it. Because it, it brings up ideas of, Uh, depriving ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about maybe a spending plan, we're going to spend money, right? Mm -hmm. Let's have a plan to do it wisely. I love that. Okay, we hear a lot about buying in bulk. I'm a Costco member. I can tell you that. I love going there. But I'm going to be really honest with you. I will buy in bulk and then throw half of it away because I'm not doing it right. What's a good way to utilize that and really make buying in bulk work in a real life situation? Yeah, you make a great point because you can think that you're saving money by spending a lot. And in some cases, it's just going to waste, as you said. So you do have to think about what are the perishable items and the non-perishable. You want to bulk the non-perishable items. I'm a huge fan of Amazon subscribe and save. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you can sign up, have the things like the paper towels, you know, the dish soap, whatever you're buying regularly. Don't buy more just buy the things that you're you're normally getting and have those sent to you. Not only can you get 15% off, you'll have it delivered to your doorstep so you don't have to go out and waste gas to go to the shopping center, the hassle, the time, all of that. So it's saving a lot of time and money. I would look at that and just start slowly adding things to that. And there are other programs out there that are similar, but the idea is that you are buying in bulk in the for the things that are not going to go bad. You don't want to buy bulk for, you know, meat or things that, right. you know, you there might be a great sale and you you stock up and you think, "Oh, we're just going to we're going to make a ton of whatever it is." And you get sick of it, right? You know, the third night, you're like, I'm not going to have any more of this lasagna that I bought five trays of. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just not, it's going to backfire, basically. So be smart. Look at the non-perishables. I really love the subscribe and save. I haven't done that yet. Speaking of subscriptions, I think a lot of us have subscriptions that we might want to fine tune. I know I have signed up for things on iTunes that are reoccurring that I don't use anymore, but I'm just too lazy to really go through and figure out what I should unsubscribe. You know, how could I save money on those? Is that another area that we really need to look at to help fine tune? Oh, totally. So the gym membership, right? Oh. You know, if you're not using it, I mean, come on, don't kid yourself. You, you have got to think about a way that you can, you know, exercise that that you're going to do it. And maybe it's right. something fun. If you're not using the gym, Quit paying for it. If you're not reading those magazines that you're subscribing to, get rid of it. And like you said, there are a ton of those monthly subscriptions. A lot of companies are making a lot of money on those monthly subscriptions. It's a good business model for them because 
we forget about them. So audit yourself. And this is part of the spending plan. When you begin looking at item by item and allocating it, you're going to go ding, ding, here's some red flags. I got to just nix that out immediately. So it becomes easier to do. Let's talk about recycling. I know a lot of us uh, want to recycle. You said that there's a recycling mission that can actually help you save money in a big way, and I'm very interested in this. Yeah, so I am a huge fan of buying used luxury clothing. And if you can think about how you can buy things like that that are gently pre-owned and used, you're going to get quality items for less. You're going to help the environment. You can also sell the items in your wardrobe that you're not wearing, make a little money. And so instead of, you know, just letting them go into the landfill, you're letting somebody else get that that gently used clothing, and then you in turn can buy that. So it's a great way to upgrade your wardrobe, save money, and save the environment. I love all of this. What about donations? I know that that's always been a big thing for me. I love the idea of selling some of the clothes that I have. I never quite get to the step of taking the pictures and getting them posted. So I'm making a donation I found that that's a good tax write-off. It is. So if you keep good receipts, definitely okay. got to you know have that valuation there. Absolutely. Donate it. I love that. There are some sites where you don't have to take the picture of the item. <gasps> you can just send it in. The really? real, the real, real is one of my favorites. And you can literally just send it in. It's got to be a certain brand of item, so okay. more top end. Mm-hmm. They will do all the photographing and the listing for you. So that's a really easy way to make a little money. And, you know, make sure that somebody else is going to use all those great things that were in your closet. I love all of these ideas. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm going home and I'm going to clean out my closet tonight, get rid of some of that stuff. A lot of us are really stressed out. And it's just overall from all sides. Maybe it's career. Maybe it is truly finances, bills, expenses. And that really impacts our life in many different ways. So what are some ways that we can reduce stress when we're talking about relationships, health, and and just overall mental well-being? So there have been lots of studies that show if you make a plan, and it, it doesn't even have to be a complex plan, simply having a plan is something that will help reduce stress. Why? It puts you in control. You feel empowered when you have a plan. So even just what we're talking about today, just creating a way to to monitor your spending and thinking about, okay, how can I save a little bit more? Once you put that in place, you're going to feel so much more empowered. And that really is the key. If you can take control and feel like you're doing something proactive, it's all about acting versus reacting. Mm. When you're reacting and you feel like, oh my gosh, things are just falling, you know, out of control, my world is falling apart, you're reacting to that, that's when we feel stressed. If you Mm -hmm. can flip that around and go, you know what, I'm going to take control. Maybe you need to sit down with a financial planner or advisor. Maybe you do need somebody to help you put a plan in place if you can't do it yourself. Most people can do it themselves, but that's the key creating a plan, getting that empowerment under your belt. I have a friend that says you need to tell your dollars where to go instead of wonder where they've gone. Yes, that's That's it. That's fantastic. Yes, yes. Okay, so earlier we heard about uh, Natalie Prass and Eric Slick. They're adorable indie music darlings, and they're about to get married, and they're building a financial life together. So how can couples really work through that? I feel like that's something that's so important. A lot of couples maybe don't want to talk about finances, and then it becomes like one of the biggest problems later on down the road. It is all about communication. So whether you're moving in together, you're getting married, if you are not talking about money, you are leaving yourself open for some problems down the road, right? So try to find common financial goals. We're not all the same. You know, some, and a lot of times opposites attract with couples, Mm -hmm. right? So one's a spender, one's a saver. One wants to retire early, one doesn't. So if you can find commonalities, that's the key. My husband and I have something that we say together, and and I can't take credit for this because he's the one, whenever we have a, a problem or we're like, you know, at ends with each other, he'll say, same team. We're on the same team, right? And so if you think about yourself as a couple moving in the same direction, you've got the same financial goals, which hopefully are to put some money away, save for the future, create some security. If you can unite on that one common goal, you're going to be in good shape. Oh, I like that same team. 
I need that (laughs) t-shirt. Okay, they say it's never too early to really start saving. I have a 10-year-old at home, and I'm trying to instill that in her, but sometimes it's pretty difficult. She doesn't quite understand the value of a dollar. How do you start to teach kids how early is too early when we're talking about finances? You know, there are things you can do with even young kids, games you can play. You can teach them about what a quarter is versus a penny, you know, teaching them about actual real money when Mm -hmm. they're little. But when they're older, you know, I think you can get more complex. You've got to gauge their ability. But a lot of people love the idea of sharing, saving, and spending. So thinking about three, the three S's. And there are some different companies out there that have like spending jars. Um, You know, one of them that comes to mind is a company called Moon Jar. And it's something for young kids to help them kind of see the three segments where their money can go and begin thinking about, well, how do I want to share? And, you know, why would I want to save for the future? And also giving them the joy of spending what they may earn. So whether it's an allowance or a gift for, for a holiday, I think if you can begin those conversations with every little bit of money that, you know, they put their hands on, you have the opportunity to teach them some lessons. And as kids get older, you know, you can really teach them. Take them to the bank with you. Mm-hmm. You know, open an, a Roth IRA if they're making money um, and they're earning a little bit. They can actually have a Roth IRA even as a minor. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So, you know, you can set up a, kind of a lifetime of success. If you think about even from age 13 to 18, if they were to put away, let's say, even a couple grand a year, maybe they've got summer jobs, part-time jobs. If you were to put that away just for six years, let th- let that earn interest and then put in nothing after that, they would have about $650,000 in their 60s at retirement. That's the power of compounding. So when you can show kids, wow, this money is going to build up to this incredible amount, they'll get excited about that and they'll want to save. I want to (laughs) save. You just said that and I'm like, okay, we're going to open a savings account for her today. That is so powerful. When you talk about those big numbers later on and just letting it ride... That's brilliant. You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about financial hardships. They don't want to talk about losing a job. They don't want to talk about possibly having to care for their mother, their father, grandparents, or or something else that would happen. How do you really plan for the unexpected, Laura? It is tough to to talk about. Um, We don't like to think about terrible circumstances or dying, but it's a reality. So one thing is having a living will. We all need a will, especially if you're a parent. Power of attorney is there to help if you can't make decisions. And a healthcare directive is there to also inform people, you know, how you'd want to be cared for if you were in the hospital and you couldn't make decisions for yourself. So those are three really important documents. Another thing to think about is life insurance. So if you are a parent, if you're a spouse, this is going to pay your beneficiaries if you're no longer around. So they can maintain their lifestyle, they can go to college, all of those good things. And it's pretty inexpensive. A term life policy can be literally a few hundred dollars a year for like half a million dollars of coverage. So don't think that it can't be affordable because it can. Also, thinking about your beneficiaries like on your retirement account at work, you know, if you've got that kind of a a benefit, make sure that you've updated it. There are so many ex-spouses that end up with the retirement benefits from the ex because they never change the beneficiary on their retirement account. So don't make that mistake. Oh my goodness. There are so many people that are listening to this right now that are checking to see. Make sure you check it. Make sure you've changed it if you need to. You know what? You have given us so many tips today. I thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you. The Money Girl, Laura Adams. Talking about money is hard, but after the conversations and stories we've heard today, it's refreshing to hear that it's a more common problem than maybe we even realized. I think the important thing is to remember, simply starting the conversation, that's the first step in gaining more financial literacy. The more we have these type of conversations, the less awkward they will be down the line. I want to thank all my guests and contributors today who helped make this episode possible. A big thanks to both Hope King and her guest, Ash Cash Exantis from The Ash Cash Show. You can check out Hope on Cheddar, where she hosts the show, Closing Bell. Thanks again to musicians Natalie Prass and Eric Slick, as well as Josh Modell of Talk House. 
Now, Talk House just launched a series called Gig Economy, which really dives into musicians' part-time past. Very cool. A huge thank you to Money Girl Laura Adams for coming by the studio today. Be sure to check out her podcast, Money Girl, available on TuneIn. She's doing some really cool stuff. All her podcasts are short format and shareable, so don't sleep on that. I mean, you just heard her. She's got a lot of really great tips. And you can find relevant links for all of my guests and resources in the description of this episode. And of course, we want to thank U.S. Bank for making all of this possible. Remember, you can always head to usbank.com slash financial IQ for any existing money management questions you may have. No matter how big or small your questions, their rich source of education materials can help you make sense of even the most complex issues. The Save Space is hosted by me, Kelly Sutton, produced at TuneIn Studios by Charles Raggio and Jenner Pasqua, sound engineered and edited by Kevin Corrigian, and additional support from Joyce Reiser, Stratton Easter, and Andrew Broadhead. Please be sure to subscribe so you get alerted to all of our future episodes when they drop. And don't forget to like, comment, and share with all your friends and family. Thank you so much for listening to The Safe Space. Join us next time when we're talking about starting a business. All your questions will be answered. <laughs>